Coming up on Network Africa. Ghanaian President Nana Akufo Addo self isolates after coming in contact with a person who tested positive for coronavirus. Malawi's new president Lazarus Chakwera cancels Independence Day celebrations amid COVID 19 concerns. Plus, more grades resume school in South Africa despite the surge in COVID-19 cases. Thank you for joining us on the program. I'm Layo Adegoke. We begin our program today with the latest corona figures from Africa. The continent has now recorded 476,967 cases. From that figure, 238,319 are the active confirmed cases and more than 227,000 people have recovered, even as the death toll passes the 11,000 mark. South Africa is top on the list of countries with the highest number of cases, followed by Egypt with 75,253 and Nigeria 28,711. Ghana is fourth with 20,085 recorded cases and Algeria 15,941. Meanwhile, the countries with the most fatalities are Egypt with 3,343, South Africa with also over 3,000, Algeria 952, Nigeria 645 and Sudan with 608. Ghana's president is in self-isolation after coming in contact with someone who tested positive for COVID-19. President Nana Akufo-Addo is now working from isolation after he went on a 14-day quarantine as a precaution when a member of his close circle was diagnosed with the virus. A government statement says although President Akufo-Addo had tested negative, he would follow the advice of his doctors just as a precautionary measure. Ghana is one of the worst affected countries in sub-Saharan Africa, although it has conducted far more tests than most nations in the region. On Friday, the Deputy Trade and Industry Minister, Carlos Kingsley, resigned after breaking self-isolation measures after he tested positive. All right, we have Joy News TV correspondent Joseph Akeble joining us now for more on this story from Accra. Hello, Joseph. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thanks for having me. All right, just help us understand what it will be like now for, president, for the president who's working from home. And so he's actually uh, working from the presidential villa. Uh, there is an accommodation complex on that villa. Uh, the seat of government is the Jubilee House. But the trend that we've seen for most of our heads of state is that they tend to reside in other facilities or in their private residence. And in this case, the president, Nana Kufado, actually, proud to this particular announcement, lived in his private residence, which was some few kilometers away from the Jubilee House. And so we are being told that following this uh, development, he's been asked to move into the Jubilee House, which is his office space where he has a presidential villa there where he'll be stationed and working. And so we understand that for the next 14 days, he's not going to step out of that particular facility. He's going to be inside. And so all correspondence to him will be by, via electronic means. And that will be how they'll be engaging with him as he carries out his functions and using technology to engage his ministers, his appointees. And if he has to address the country on any such issue, that will also be carried out. And so we'll not see him at any particular event. The interesting thing is that on day, that was the last time he actually stepped out and this was the voter registration exercise that is currently ongoing in Ghana ahead of the 2020 elections. And so he visited some registration centers to monitor how the process is going. And it was after that, a few 48 hours afterwards, then the information came in that he has to go into isolation. And so that was the last time he was spotted publicly. And the understanding is that for the next 14 days, we will not spot him in any public engagement. 
And do we do we know who this member of his close circle that tested positive, do we know who that person is and who others who might have been exposed to this person? Currently, we do not know who this individual is, but per the statement and how it was worded, we get the understanding that we could be looking at more than one person because the statement put out by the Minister for Information, Kojo Point Kroma, it says that at least one person in his close circles. And so that is the minimum number that was put out there. And so the information we are getting is that it could be more than one, but there's one person and that individual has not been named, except the point being made that he, the president himself, was tested right after the individual tested positive, and the president's test came out negative. But the doctors have advised that he sticks to the protocol of going into isolation for the next 14 days, then a repeat test will be done, then a decision will be taken as to whether he can move out and work, depending on what the result says. All right, let's talk about the Deputy Trade and Industry Minister. On Friday, he resigned after breaking self-isolation measures, despite him testing positive. What reactions have there been to this? In fact, prior to his resignation, there was huge condemn condemnation from all quarters, from civil society organizations, from health experts, among others. Uh, the backstory is that he had tested positive and he actually left the uh, facility where he was receiving treatment to go and monitor this same registration exercise that I spoke to you about a short while ago. And so it was during a radio interview, he spoke to one of my colleagues on our sister platform, our, our local dialect speaking platform on Asempa FM. And in that interview, he did admit that despite knowing his status as being positive, he stepped out. And so within the period of he granting that interview on Thursday afternoon through to Friday morning, there was huge condemnation and calls for him to be arrested and prosecuted and calls for the president to fire him as well. Then on Friday morning, uh, sometime around 9 a.m., a statement came from the presidency indicating that they have accepted his resignation from office as deputy trade and industry minister. And so since that came in, it was satisfactory to many people, but still some civil society organizations like Occupy Ghana, a very key pressure group here in Ghana, are still not satisfied in the action that he should be arrested and prosecuted because we have passed interim legislations that make it illegal for people to breach the protocols. And so they make the point that an offense has been committed and they want him to be arrested and prosecuted. The last time we asked the director of communication and the presidency as to whether they intend to have the law enforcement agencies take up that matter, the response was that the decision has not been taken yet in regards to whether he's prosecuted or not. But the point was made that the presidency finds it satisfactory that at least he has realized that he acted wrongly and not doing what was expected of him as a leader and then going ahead to breach the protocols for each reason they decided to accept his resignation. Mm. Well, Joseph, finally, before I let you go, Ghana is the fifth highest on the continent looking at the numbers. How is the country working to flatten its curve? From the onset, the strategy has been uh, aggressive testing. We have tested yeah. some 310,159, one of the highest in the continent, actually. And we have also been tracing the contact of those who have tested positive and treat them as well. So those are the three things that the country has been working with. The challenge in recent times has been the fact that uh, there's a bit of challenge in the testing centers, getting reagents to carry out the test. And so our current figures that we put out there, the cumulative case count that stands at 20,085, it's actually test results as at July 2, because there's a backlog in some of the uh, testing centers. But the Director General of the Health Service, Dr. Patrick Kumar Mwaji, has assured that they intend to procure some more items needed for the laboratories to pursue the agenda of increased testing, then to isolate individuals who have tested positive and contact trace those who uh, may have come into contact with a positive case. And that is the approach that they intend um, carrying out. But the immediate solution that they intend to roll out is to get the reagents and the other items that we need in the labs to ensure that we have the capacity to continue as some of the leading uh, testing centers in the globe in terms of the numbers as a sure way of dealing with the spread of the virus. All right, then, Joseph Akable, Joy News TV correspondent. Thank you for speaking to us on Network Africa. Thanks for having me. Tanzania has closed most of its centers designated to handle COVID-19 patients. The government said that a significant drop in the number of coronavirus infections led to the closure of the treatment centers across the country. According to Health Minister Umi Mwalimu, there are now only 11 centers, including private health centers, that are open. 
These are from the 85 centers that had initially been set up across the country to isolate COVID-19 patients. She also adds that the coronavirus is heading towards an end in Tanzania, but cautions people not to relax, relax as there could be a second wave of infections. Malawi's newly elected president, Lazarus Chakwera, has been inaugurated as the country's sixth leader at a ceremony attended by only 100 guests in the capital, Lilongwe. The ceremony coincides with Malawi's 56th Independence Day, which celebrations were cancelled amid coronavirus concerns. On Sunday, President Chakwera ordered that the ceremony be moved from the national stadium to the country's military headquarters. Both events were due to be marked by a huge jamboree in Lilongwe's football stadium. Meanwhile, Malawi's Vice President Saulos Chilima and his wife Mary have tested negative for coronavirus days after his personal secretary died from the virus. Mr. Chilima made the announcement today at the inauguration ceremony in the capital. President Lazarus Chakwera over the weekend said coronavirus was spreading fast in the country, with Mr. Chilima adding that the surge in cases was alarming and frightening. Malawi has so far recorded a total of 1,000 742 COVID-19 cases, including 19 deaths. We have Yvonne Sundu, Malawian journalist, joining us now for more on the program from Lilongwe. Hello, Yvonne. Thank you for speaking to us. Talk to us about today's rather low-key inauguration ceremony, which I assume dampened the euphoria generated by President Chakwera's historic victory. Well, indeed, it is true that uh, the mood was a little bit uh, dampened by the fact that mostly inaugurations and Independence Day activities are always a big thing in Malawi. Whether they are taking place in the southern city of Blantyre or in the capital of Lilongwe, it's always a big day for most Malawians. And there were lots of Malawians that were tra uh, trekking to the capital city from different parts of the country in order to be part of the inauguration plus the Independence Day celebration, such that the news of the cancellation of the um, Independence Day celebrations, you know, was coming at a time when some of them were on the road. However, still, some people still managed to find their way of, you know, having low-key celebrations within their households, that is, without necessarily taking themselves to the streets or trying to converge at a one place. I should mention that uh, historically, this day is going to be remembered moving forward as um, the year perhaps that so many things obviously changed and for Malawians, they had to commemorate the Independence Day in the confines of their homes, as opposed to trekking to one big place for a celebration. Yeah, I was going to ask, COVID-19 is the reason for the modest pomp and today is also Independence Day. How are citizens also celebrating, especially after the president canceled celebrations? There were some mini events that individual individuals had organized. In those ones, I must mention that uh, they are still going ahead. There were some parties, you know, that people had organized on their own. But in terms of the the national big bash, it's no longer there. And then there are also other people that are just perhaps enjoying their drinks within their households. And so the day has ended. All right, just before I let you go, the vice president and his wife were in attendance and they announced there that they have tested negative, thankfully. Was there any other dignitary in attendance, perhaps former President Mutharika? Uh, allow me to correct, uh, to correct you a bit because the, um, the announcement that uh, Vice President Salo Shirimei and his wife Mary tested negative to COVID-19 was made through the vice president's social media pages and not necessarily at the commemoration. If indeed it was also mentioned, it was just a follow-up, you know, taking advantage of the fact that there were millions of people back home. I, I, I mean, there were millions of people in their houses that were watching. But initially, the communication was made through his Facebook as well as uh, Twitter pages. And in terms of uh, the attendance, uh, former president Peter Mutariga was not was not around. Uh, I should believe that an invitation was sent to him and just like other former president, Bagiri Muluzi, who saw Malawi 
Malawi's first 10 years of democracy, uh, but he, will, or he too was not around. Or perhaps it might be an issue of maybe them uh, trying to relax a bit after realizing that the event is not going to be as big as it was supposed to be. But seriously speaking, the invitation was sent to them, but they did not attend uh, the inauguration. As such, you know, the handover of the sword, which uh, symbolizes the handover of um, power in terms of uh, the president being the commander, chief, the commander in chief of the Malawi army. It was done by the 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 commander uh, who I should say it was done by the chief of the Malawi army instead of the outgoing president because symbolically it is supposed to be done by the outgoing president. So with the Mutarika's absence, that's how um, the uh, the chief of the Malawi army was the one who had to do the symbolic uh, handover. Well, Yvonne Sundu, Malawian journalist, thank you for speaking to us on Network Africa. While well, you're watching Network Africa on channels television, still to come on the program. Black Lives Matter movement stares a Ghanaian artist to produce a new work of art she calls Say Their Name during this COVID-19 limbo. Please stay with us. Welcome back to the program. South Africa's Education Ministry has continued with its phased reopening of schools despite the surge in coronavirus cases. Grades are 5-year-olds, grade 6, 11-year-olds and grade 11, 16-year-olds have returned to school a month after final year students reopened. There have been coronavirus infections among learners and teachers since the resumption of classes in June. Here's more details in this report. Over 2 million grades are 6 and 11 returned to school in South Africa this Monday to join the grades 7 and 12 who returned about a month ago. It's still a raging debate on how safe it is for children to return to school at this time, especially as about 2,740 teachers and over 1,000 pupils have already tested positive since the resumption of school for the two grades uh, a month ago. I feel good when I'm, co I'm coming back to school. Okay, you're not scared about corona? I'm, going I'm not scared out. as long as I know that I'll be social distance with my friends. While Jemima and many pupils like her are happier than worried to see school and friends again, many parents are more worried than happy, or they say they're somewhat helpless. I get worried at times because we don't know when, whether when she comes back at home she will be infected or what. Okay. But there's nothing that we can do. As they say, they must come back to school and resume. Then yes, she must come back to school because I normally tell her every morning, don't forget to put on your mask, don't forget to sanitize. Uh, recently, they announced on TV that a great R should come to school. I don't feel comfortable at all. I don't feel comfortable. I work in a hospital. I, I see all these things happening in the hospital. I'm really scared. I'm scared. I can't bring my daughter to school. I can't. I'm sorry. <laughs> A number of provinces like KwaZulu Natal and on shore schools in Willing provinces have opted to keep the great R's back home for now. Briefing the nation on Sunday night, They're the Minister for Basic Education, Angie Motsecha, says all pupils in the country must be back at school by the end of August this year. The social risks are very high for vulnerable children in this environment. The huge risk of juvenile delinquency, the huge risk of youth criminality. As I said, the school we visited on Friday, two of the girls ha have now unintended and unplanned pregnancy. So there's also a huge risk of teenage pregnancy and all sorts of social ills. I think it's a national responsibility, but it's also a humble request to say, let's pull together. Because the risks are very high if things don't work well in education. A number of schools where COVID cases have been recorded have been closed for a few days, disinfected and reopened. Some teacher unions are still complaining about malfunctioning screening material and vandalism at some schools. There's also a spike in number of confirmed cases in the country, but the minister insists that government is doing its best to improve safety. Matriculation examinations have been fixed for November. From Johannesburg, South Africa. Betty Dibia, Channels Television News.
Only one person per household is allowed to go out into the streets between 6 and 12 in Madagascar after the government placed one of its main regions, which covers the capital, Antananarivo, back under a strict lockdown. The country, notable for herbal tonic it launched, known as COVID Organics, has seen a recent surge in coronavirus infections. The government announced that the lockdown would come into effect on Monday to end on the 20th of July. It will include a ban on traffic in and out of the region and a curfew on the movement of people on the street. There are 2,941 confirmed cases and 32 people have died since the virus was first detected on the island in March. Madagascar made international news in May when President Andre Rajoelina launched COVID Organics, which contains the anti-malarial Artemisia plant, saying it could cure and prevent coronavirus. It has been widely distributed and is being given freely to pupils in schools across the country. Although its efficacy has not yet been scientifically established, a number of African countries have also ordered it to try it for themselves. Kenya's president, Uhuru Kenyatta, has announced a phased reopening of the country amid a rising number of coronavirus infections. The president lifted travel restrictions in and out of Nairobi, Mombasa and Mandera counties, which are some of the regions with the highest coronavirus cases. However, the 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. nationwide curfew remains in place for a further 30 days. Places of worship will reopen with a maximum of 100 participants allowed in a service, which should not last longer than an hour, and local flights will resume from the 15th of July. International flights may also resume in August, with strict COVID-19 protocols expected to be followed. The president said the country would revert to a lockdown if the infection rates worsened. The country has so far recorded 7,886 cases of COVID-19 including 160 deaths. Well, after Senegal closed its borders in March, the internationally renowned Ghana-based visual artist Roha Opoku had no option but to remain at a residency in Dakar, where she heard of George Floyd's death, the African-American who was killed in May. She felt compared to honor him and the Black Lives Matter movement with a new work of art she calls Say Their Name. When Senegal closed its borders in March, Zora Boko found she had no choice but to stay at a residency in Dakar. The Ghanaian German artist had been creating textile collages to explore her self-image after a cancer diagnosis. But the death of George Floyd, a black man who died in the United States police custody, inspired the 44-year-old to stitch a new piece in tribute of the Black Lives Matter movement. The recent happenings and protests following uh, George Floyd's death uh, have shaken us and awakened us, I believe, and um, sharpened our senses in what kind of world we, we want to live in. Um, for, for weeks I had no words. Um, I was... And, but I needed something to express my anger, I mean, my emotions, because this is ongoing and repetitive and it's, it's not something what um, I can just um, observe. I really have to do something about it. Opoku had called the white and indigo dyed canvas Say Their Names. She has soon dozens of images of an unidentified face from ancient Egyptian art. Some are painted in red and tumble down a screen print of Opoku's face like teardrops. The artist has a rare black perspective in that she grew up surrounded by white people in communist East Germany. And I was always uh, interested in like, actually disappearing in an environment um, because of my upbringing. So I always um, had this negotiation of how much do am I visible and how much is visible from my identity. The quest for identity is a central theme in Opoku's work. In early self-portraits, Opoku obscured her face with plants. In her latest series, 
she combines images of bare tree branches from her native Germany with dissected photos of herself. And that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Adegoke. Do stay safe.